So, all right, now we've got bureaucracy out the way. Uh, welcome to my session, The Five Pillars of Collaborative Product Ownership. So, my name's John LeDrew. I've been in software for about 20 years now, um, and I've done a ton of different things in that time. Um, in that time, I've been a software engineer, team lead, technical lead, development manager, tester, business analyst, project manager, uh, and also a product owner at different times. Um, before we begin, could I ask anyone in this room who consider themselves to be a product owner, even maybe a little bit, possibly a BA? Job title. Your job, all right, well, if it's your job title, then you can't get away from this. Could you just stand up, please, if that's okay? Yes, you're cute. <laughs> so, if you could take one of these stickers, there we go, and if you could possibly apply these stickers to yourselves, uh, wherever you feel, wherever you feel is appropriate, there you go. Uh, are there any, any product owners hiding that don't have a stick? You're right, so if you could apply this sticker, um, and it, you can sit down again, thank you. I just wanted to know where you all were. Uh, so who's, um, does anyone want to, can anyone say, so that, that sticker for those of you that aren't POs, uh, that says I'm the last ringable neck, or the single ringable neck. Um, who's heard that phrase before? Has anyone heard that phrase before, single ringable neck? Do you know where it originated? from out of interest. So it actually came from, it was coined by, uh, by Jeff Sutherland, who created Scrum, who defined the product owner, who you know, invented the, uh, the role of the product owner. Who likes being the single ringable neck? Is, does anyone like thrive on that? I, I sort of do, yeah. Oh, you, can't, you do? Really? Really? <laughs> I don't know, I, I find, the threat of violence quite quite <laughs> negative in general in my life if that if I find <laughs> 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 all right well maybe maybe that's it brummy POs are the are the way to go for uh, if that's what you're looking for so um, one of the things I I found is is that the is is really yes yeah, sure the language is um, it's fine but who believes that there needs to be a single ringable neck does anyone give me a, an answer as to why they think we need this single point of accountability. What are the reasons why we ask for that in our POs a lot of the time? Because it's ownership. Ownership, yeah. So having, what would define what you mean by ownership in that? So in that. I think the risk of not having a single ringable neck is that the risk that you run is kind of um, designed by committee. Um, no single person actually decides yeah. whether the product is going to do this or not. So you could just end up with a bunch of people on the team arguing about what to do next. Mm -hmm. So you need someone to say, this is the direction we're going in. Okay, that's right. How does that, so there's a difference though, because obviously single ringable neck is not talking about, actually in that definition, the focus on that is on accountability, isn't it? As in it's whose fault it is. In fact, I have another variation of this, uh, of these stickers where I have a few more uh, fun ones. Another phrase I'd learned recently was the one throat to choke, quite like that one. Um, another variation, and I've, I've also got stickers that say, uh, it's probably, uh, it's all my fault, and I'm probably going to be fired for this. Um, the, 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 one of the things I find is, is actually, what, what's the value in there being one head on the block. Is there value in that? Everybody else gets off scot-free. Everyone else gets off scot-free. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. So, so it's in the rest of the team, so they can all. Okay. Is it so? Some one one phrase that someone described to me once was they said it's a little bit like that they could be potentially, and this was that seeing this in a positive light, like the umbrella for the team, like they kind of protect the team from all of the bad shit that's going on outside. So, so they're there to kind of protect them. The other thing I've heard described is, is they become the single point of communication as well. So you could have 900 stakeholders all around the world and um, you wouldn't want those people, God forbid, speaking to any of your engineers because crazy stuff might happen. I don't know what might happen with that, but that madness might happen. They could be distracted because you just want them obviously to have, well also, you, I mean, who really wants their engineers talking to their customers, right? I mean, that would be uh, humiliating and terrible for the company. Reputation down the pan um, immediately, I guess. Uh, so you see all of this stuff around protection, and I'm, I'm not sure that really stands up 
uh, I don't know how valuable that is in, in the long run, but we'll, we'll go into it. So what I'd like you to do is use your post-it notes. Um, if you've got one or two, uh, if you could each think of one word that describes an attribute of a great product owner. Okay, so what's one word, a thing that a great product owner would have to do however you see their job, I guess, uh, a bulletproof vest in some cases, might be it's three words, but, oh, <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have a post-it note, then shout, there is a, it just got brought. Oh, well, Sean's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> oh. okay, so, does everyone have that? If you could, everyone have their word. I'm gonna, if you just pass, begin to pass them forward when you uh, do it, I will stick them up. Pass them down. I'll come back and grab the rest. If you just start to pass them forward, and someone at the front can gather them up, and I will stick them up. And we will go through them in a second. Oh, look at that. There we go. I'll just stick them all up and then talk about a few of them. Okay, this is quite cool. Prioritising. Foresight. Foresight's a fun one. We can talk about that one. You know that's all right? Knowledgeable. Oh, there's loads. There's more of you in here. It's amazing how they, they fit you all in. Some people brought their own post-its. <laughs> Did, were there actually post-its in the bag, or do you actually want these, these agilists that always have a pack of post-its in your pocket? <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's like just some people, you know, you can't leave the house without a pack of Sharpies and some post-its, just in case, just in case you have to facilitate something. So... Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, exactly. They might be like, wait a sec. <laughs> we, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Guys, I think we need a retrospective. <laughs> it's like, can anyone, can anyone help? Um, so on here, I'm going to pick a few out. Foresight. Who said foresight? All right. Could you, could you explain what you mean by foresight? So like Mystic Meg, is that um, is people too young for Mystic Meg possibly? I don't know. Do you remember Mystic Meg? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Foresight, is that the, I'm guessing that's not the kind of foresight you mean. Well, but uh, She got it wrong quite a bit, but then I think maybe we get it wrong quite a bit as well, possibly, when we have foresight. Who, who thinks we're good at foresight in general? I will go into that a bit more, so we'll, I'll, I'll park that there, ponder that one. <laughs> um, who, let's have a look, who said, Listening, which I'll put those together. Listening? What do you mean by, oh, two people said listening. Well, I'll get, I'll get it from both of you, so we'll have a, a listening face-off. What, what, uh, <laughs> what, what do you mean by listening? So listening to all the stakeholders. Yeah. Okay, and what did you think? Similar or? Uh, Similar sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, just listening just to get a varied point of view than, yeah. than your vision. Sure. Listening. Yeah, so being able to consume, listen to all of those people out there and to formulate that into, I'm guessing, vision, into some sort of a vision. Who said vision? Vision. So is that, is that what, what do you mean by vision? I mean, having, having a light in the sky that, that, yeah. that you can not only understand, but you can communicate. Okay. So when, when small decisions need to be made, you can just always bring that up to where we're going with yeah. the picture. And that... Would that come from all of that listening that you've done? That that comes from that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah from understanding. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go into every single one because we've got a lot of stuff here, but I will leave those there. I want to ask, let's see, what one, what other one would I like to pick on? All right, we might as well go to collaborative. What do people understand by collaborative? For Who said collaborative? Yeah, who said collaborative? What do you mean by collaborative um, in this setting? <coughs> Could I ask who they're collaborating with? Um, who the product owners are collaborating 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Who, who are the, um, you know what, I won't ask that question now. We'll go into it as we go, as we go forward. That's interesting though. Okay. So right now, I don't normally do drawing, but I have a flip chart, so I might as well. Right now it feels a little bit like you've got the product owner here. We've got our team over here, so these people are all developing. I can't, I'm not going to draw like five little things, but those squiggles are people. And you've got everything else here. So what you said, all the various bits of the organization. And the PO sort of sits in, in the middle of that. Is that, is that right, do you think? Is that, is that how, is it, who perceives their role a bit like that at the moment? In the, yeah, that's OK. Uh, I'll, we'll leave, I'll leave that as a thought. OK. So we've got all of this stuff on here. Who knows a PO or has worked with a PO, or if you're confident enough, would say who, that, that actually encompasses all of those things? Has anyone met a PO that really is the super PO? Or is maybe there's some struggle? That person. So you are. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. He has to say that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, this person has two votes for being all of those things. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, I don't know how many people there are in here. I would say that I rarely get anyone saying, yes, I absolutely know either. <laughs> but, well, rarely do people say, that's me, you know, or rarely do they also uh, I have people found them. So I don't know whether it's whether it's real or maybe we expect a little too much from our product owners. So this is the this Agile Alliance definition. Um, I was sort of, I know that product owner is really a sort of scrum centric concept, but actually it's been broadened out quite a bit. And this is the Agile Alliance sort of non-framework centric definition. Um, and I wanna go through it and we'll, we'll have a look. So the product owner is a role on a product development team. Point out, interestingly, that puts that person here, not in, on their own. Um, responsible for managing the product backlog in order to achieve the desired outcome that a product development team seeks to accomplish. Now, what I quite like about this, and unfortunately, this definition does kind of go downhill from this point onwards, um, is, is that the product owner is described as being part of the development team. So interestingly, when we spoke about collaboration and listening, all of that collaboration and listening was happening here with the organization, but not here, not from the team. And also, the product development team themselves are the ones that collaboratively decide upon the goal that they're wanting to accomplish, which is also uh, useful, I think. So yeah, as I said, it goes downhill from here onwards. So here we have the next bit. So these are like sub points on the, on the page. I did check it the other day just to make sure they hadn't updated it because I had tweeted them about how kind of generally awful this definition is, um, but they, they haven't corrected it yet. Um, so clearly identify and describe product backlog items in order to build a shared understanding of the problem and solution with the product development team, uh, which seems to go completely against the first point. So this is apparently, the PO is apparently identifying all the problems on their own, then they define the problems, then they solve the problem, and then they communicate that problem to the team, uh, at which point I guess the team go to the pub. Um, I'm not sure. I, I kind of found this quite a baffling bit of definition, really, because it felt like, again, the PO being completely isolated, working on their own, and not really collaborating at all. Um, and then, then we have this one. So make decisions regarding the uh, priority of backlog items in order to deliver the maximum outcome with the minimum output. I used to find maximum outcome and minimum output quite funny because it sounded like it should be said in the voice of, I don't know, Schwarzenegger in The Terminator or something. Um, but it is actually from uh, Jeff Patton from the story mapping book, if people are familiar with that. That was his, his definition. So I still find it kind of funny. Uh, but I think that, so minimum output is effort. Uh, effort, output is effort and outcome is the value. Uh, to, to explain that in, in a way that makes, makes a little, in slightly better English. What I find interesting about this is, is how do we make these decisions? How do we know? How do we know what the most important thing is as a PO? Start with user needs. 
start with, well, that is a really good idea, <laughs> okay? We will dive into that a little bit, in a little, a little bit later. Well, amazing, genius idea. Uh, it's been around for a while, this whole listening to the customers thing. Uh, it's amazing how few people are doing it. Um, so then we've got determine whether a product back backlog item was satisfactorily delivered. So again, how do we do this? How do we know when something is done? How do we sign it off? Anyone want to tell me how do they? How do you? If you're a PO now, how do you do that last check mark? How do you know that it's finished and ready and done? Acceptance criteria. Acceptance criteria is a fun one. So the things that we thought, basically, that's kind of like saying, is it to spec to some degree, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So where, who, who's seen it? Who's using it once it's done by most companies? Does it? So put your hand up if done means in production in front of your users for you right now. Awesome. I'm just gonna. Just call out the awesome while it's there. That's great. Uh, who, who means done is in some sort of QA environment that is actually identical to production? No one? So then done is, you've seen it working on a, in a development environment? Well, that's different shades of done, though, haven't you? You've got it's done, it's in front of the customers, and then you've got it's done, it's met its KPIs or it's met its criteria. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I think that the delta between those two duns is the problem, <laughs> I think, in many organizations. Okay, I won't... Uh, uh, yeah, so ensure transparency of the upcoming work of the product. This one I found really strange based on the initial description. The problem I have is, is that ensuring transparency suggests that the product owner um, is like the gateway. They're the ones that are making the, the backlog transparent. But if the backlog could then be described as the, the development team's goal or the kind of direction or the vision or a, a, a breakdown of that, um, and that based on the initial, the first bit of this definition, the team decided that together, then there's no need to make it transparent. They decided it together. They, they all jointly decide upon what is important and what isn't important based on their shared understanding of the vision. So I found this, this very confusing. So yeah, all of that definition, other than that first bit, I kind of find frustrating. And I think that, interestingly, part of the reason why we don't have as many POs that fit this um, is that very few people really understand kind of the role of the PO. And I think that that's not only individually, as in what do we do when we're operating as a PO, but also organisationally, we don't really get it, I don't think. I think organisations don't know how to work with it. So here's a question for you. Where does the work come from? All of our teams are doing stuff every day. They, they work on things. Where does that come from? Anyone? We're all doing, building things, doing things. Does it just pop into the backlog. Governance, so you've been told you've got to do something, yep. change the law, you have continuous improvements, you want to make things better. Yeah, so where does that eventually come from? So like, like I don't know, so example, team has, uh, manager comes down and says, all right, so we need to do this thing. Where, d where does that work come from? We need to in build this feature, we need to fix this bug, we need to change the color of a button, I don't know. What, what's? The problem. The problem? The problem? A problem, okay. But where does, who decide that that problem had to come from somewhere? Customer, customer needs, okay. It, does, it, does it come from customers all the time? Managers, no. Senior management, okay, that's a good one. So senior, I think management is prob some sort of management above where the team is currently is probably the most common answer I get from that, as in what, where does the work originate from? So how do they... How do they know what to do? As in, so it comes from senior management. How did they know? Where did it come from for them? Did they just imagine it? Did they wake up one morning and say, today, team A is going to do that? Or did they have some? Could be the sales team. So why would the sales team ask? Maybe their customers want something. So like, it might be sort of a regulatory thing that you need to do. Could be. So they, in general, the, the, do people have the word hippo, you know, the hippo in the room, highest paid person's opinion. Um, I've seen that the, the, yeah, that the hippo in the room is often where most of this stuff originates from, as in there's lots and lots of needs. They could, be cust they could come from customers, sometimes they do. A lot of the time it's someone who's paid more money than the other people that are normally doing the work has noticed or has decided that there is a need for something, they have an idea and they want to implement that because 
that they know everything, and that's the basic idea. Are we good at knowing what to do? I asked this before. Someone said foresight, uh, as in knowing when you, if you're wanting to implement a feature, you obviously need to have an idea of what to implement and an idea that maybe there might be some value that comes from that. Are we good at knowing what the valuable things are? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. We get it. Sometimes it's probably an accurate, <laughs> an accurate definition. Um, so we, th this is a, I don't know if people have heard of a company called the Standish Group. They do generally quite controversial studies on things like the use of features. There's the chaos study, which was looking at agile methods and non-agile methods. Th they're always really controversial because it's really bloody hard to work out how to really, how to define what these things are. They produced a report called Exceeding Value. They also looked at this stuff in the chaos study, um, which you may have heard of the chaos study. It's, I think it's every, I think they do it every year, and it's a rolling 10-year time frame of data that they look at for project success. Um, that's actually kind of declares it worse than this. So this looks at, this basically says that in the, I think, thousand or so business critical, mostly internal systems, so this is like finance systems and intranet type systems, that kind of thing, 80% um, of features in those were hardly ever or very infrequently at best used by the people using them. Um, and that's kind of shocking if you think about that translating to 80% of most organizations IT budgets um, and software improvement budgets. So we're, we're kind of bad at that. <laughs> um, it's not great. So how could we improve this? Um, so the most important thing that we always forget in when working in kind of lean and agile ways is a thing that I'm going to get back to uh, at the end. I'll leave that hanging there. You can have a think about what that, that thing might be, uh, and I will come back to it. Before that, I want to jump back to uh, a few, uh, a number of decades to, to a little history lesson. Who, does anyone know who this is? Anyone idea? <coughs> Turn of the century, American guy, liked factories. Not Ford, but his friend. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this guy's Frederick Winslow Taylor. Um, you will have heard potentially of the term Taylorism. Uh, he is an early 20th century humanitarian, uh, kind of. Um, he's known for the high regard in which he keeps his workers. This is a, a little statement he made about um, some of the people working in a factory he was working with. The ordinary pig iron handler is not the type of man well suited to shoveling. He's too stupid. There is too much mental strain, too much knack required of a shoveler for the pig iron handler. So he's not who's not a humanitarian, I, I, I lied, um, he's a scientist. And what's interesting is that, that while we tend to pillory him in the Agile community for being the source, well, him and kind of Ford together, really, uh, the source of all of the bad management practices that we have ever seen, um, what we kind of forget is actually that he was one of the, the first people um, and the first, some of the earliest examples of organizations using data and looking at experimentation and the scientific method as a way of actually driving decision making and strategy within the organization. So we'll have a look at what, what he was doing. Um, so what he did was, and what he's known for is that he's working, he was working in a metal factory um, and he wanted to improve the efficiency. So what he started by doing was breaking down every process. So if you imagine a typical factory, you've got stations, people working on different things. And he broke that down into each of those steps and kind of detail, okay, so we've got pig iron handling, people shoveling metal here, people working on the metal here. Um, and then he, he measured everything. So he went to each step and was like, okay, well, how long does it take this person to shovel, you know, shovel the, the iron into the furnace? How long does it take this person to work this piece of metal into whatever item they were producing? Um, and to, to his um, shock, when he went to each of the different stations, he discovered that there was massive variation. So you've got five pig iron handlers all doing stuff, and one of them would take, you know, a minute to do this shovel, and the other person would take 30 seconds, and they were all doing stuff differently. It was like they considered themselves to be craftspeople. I mean, these, these worms, what were they thinking, that they might have some sort of individual skill? And some of them were, like, insisting on using the, the shovel that their mum gave them for Christmas. Some of them would just sort of gather it up like this, and he's just like, for God's sakes, this is madness, you know, you need to do things in the right way. There must be a, a, a one true way to do this that's better, and we will work out how to do that. Um, I mean, granted, 
uh, he didn't necessarily approach this in the best, with the best way. But let's look at what he did do and what he did well. So what he ended up doing was he formed a hypothesis. Hmm, I don't know, well, maybe the way that Bob's doing it with his shovel that his mum gave him, maybe if they all had shovels like Bob's shovel, they would do it a bit quicker. Hmm, I don't know, that seems like a reasonable theory. So let's do an experiment. Use these shovels. They all said, I don't want to use the shovel. I don't want to use you know, Bob's mum's shovel. And they said, you're fired. And they got new people in. So eventually, uh, they had a team of people that were willing to do what he was asking them. Um, after his experiment, he learned from that. Well, did they do quicker? Well, some of them did quicker, some of them a bit slow. Well, I don't know, maybe if we change it, reduce the size of the shovel. That's what he actually did. There is huge amounts of writing uh, from Taylor on shovel sizes. I can't remember, it was like eight pounds or something that, that was the ideal amount of, of, uh, of pig iron to carry. They learned from that. Well, interestingly, this learning happens regardless of whether or not this experiment proves or disproves this hypothesis, okay? You've got to learn, learning what not to do is just as important as learning what to do. And that learning feeds into future hypotheses, which then creates an environment of continuous learning. Now, there is a problem, there is a big problem. <laughs> the, the elephant in the room for Taylorism is that while he created an environment of continuous learning and they did have huge, I mean, you know, he, his factories were massively successful compared to, from an efficiency perspective and a throughput perspective, compared to all of the other factories, and which is why he had a massive following at the time. Um, the challenge is that he was missing something quite important, and the other problem was that while he had this continuous learning, because he regarded the management, essentially, the management teams and the kind of the upper echelons of the organization, they were the only people that had the mental capacity for this planning work. Um, as a result, this continuous learning environment was, was limited just to those people. So what was he, uh, yeah, he was missing something. What was he missing? Let, let's fast forward a few decades. Pardon? A soul, well, a soul could be one. <laughs> so, yeah, at about the same time, Aretha Franklin was releasing this well-known track. On the other side of the Pacific, there was another movement underway. Um, so who's this guy? Anyone know this one? On the other side of the Pacific is, is an important clue, <laughs> but maybe the fact is, obviously. Mr. Pardon? Mr. Toy. Well, not quite. That's close. So... Uh, not, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, her moustache looks pretty nice there. Um, the, uh, so this is a guy called Taichi Ono, who you may have heard of, absolutely. He, between 1948 and 1975, he created, um, he, well, him with Eija Toyoda created the Toyota production system. Um, this later became Lean Manufacturing, which then later became Lean Software, and that maybe the Agilists will disagree with me, but it's true, regardless of what they say, did eventually seed the beginnings of what Agile software became. Um, he had a somewhat different attitude. This is one of the things he said, as well as many. People don't go to Toyota to work, they go there to think. So clearly, which is an, a really lovely quote, uh, clearly a very different attitude as, uh, to Taylor, as Taylor clearly didn't think that anyone had the capacity to think uh, in his organization. Um, so they created um, this thing called the. So I'm quite far ahead of. Uh, I'm quite. I'm going quite quickly. So they created a thing called the Toyota Way or the Toyota Production System. Now in 2001, this became the Toyota Way. Um, and what this was was essentially the Toyota Way, which interestingly was published in 2001 uh, alongside just before uh, I think. Um, the, the well-known manifesto that, that we all bow down to. Um, the, uh, is what, they, what they did was is they grouped together these 14 principles um, grouped under two uh, key pillars, um, which we'll go into. Now, this talk is not about lean uh, you know, Toyota or lean principles. This is not what I'm, I'm covering. We want to, I, I, I want to look into them and we can look at what we can learn from them. I highly, highly recommend for those of you that haven't looked into the, lean, the Toyota production system or specifically the Toyota way, um, Google it. There's a great Wikipedia page going through it. It's really well worth looking into. It's a, it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic document. Um, so before that, I found this video. So I'm hoping the tech will work. We'll see what happens. There's a little video which uh, is from a, a um, Toyota factory in Burniston, which is in Derbyshire. Hopefully it will work. Oh, there we go.
it's quite overwhelming when you walk through the first time. You've got things flying everywhere, boxes and trucks. When you walk through the door and you actually see how big the place is. After you've been here and you realise how everything operates, you can understand why everything's in a certain place, everything has to be in a certain place. My name's Pete Dennis. I started here in May the 11th, 1992. I left mining and I applied for the position of team member in the press shop. I got took on as a team leader when we first started here in 1992. And I can remember walking into the press shop, being in mind the presses I'd worked on were probably maximum up to 50 tonne. We walked into there and they're 3,000 tonne presses and they're about as big as a block of flats. <laughs> so that was a little bit daunting for me. The Toyota production system is the foundation of what Toyota do. Every single member here has the right to stop the line. If he sees something that's not quite right, we have what we call the hand-on system. He has the right to stop that line. Everybody's involved in it. It's not just top-down. We encourage, as we call it, bottom-up. So if a team member comes to me and says, I have an idea for this, you don't ignore him. There's nobody has a better idea than that member. The biggest asset we've got is, is the guys that work here. And it's not because you, know, you, you cut them open and they lock a sticker up and they've got Toyota through it. That's not it, it's just the amount of faith and pride that the people have got. And they will do what they can to help this company because they know it's helping them at the end of the day. It's a little bit too much like a recruitment video in a second, so we'll move on. <laughs> um, there's some really interesting things in that, uh, in that video. So who's heard of the Andon system before? So if you saw in the video, I quite like it just because I, I hadn't seen it before, but there's the guy kind of reaching up and when they're talking about it and pulling a yellow cord. It's actually now a button, <laughs> sadly. The cord is gone because apparently having big cords running everywhere is, is dangerous and gets in the way. Um, but yeah, what, what that means is, is they're able to stop the line whenever they see a problem. Um, and this happens you know, often, sometimes hundreds of times a day, it might be very brief, but they'll notice any kind of quality problems, any kind of issues, um, which is completely counter to um, some of the Ford ideas. You know, never stop the line is a kind of a core idea for many of the other, many of the other factories. There's another thing he mentioned there, which is that no one has a better idea than the team member that brought it to me. So this is an interesting one. Um, so they actually have a, a quite a well-known suggestion box uh, system, uh, um, suggestion system, staff suggestion system in, um, at Ford. Now, so they have, I'll ask you a question, they've got roughly 300,000 staff today. Um, and how many suggestions on an annual basis do you think they get? You want to make a guess? Roughly? A few hundred, <laughs> yeah. Millions is closer. They get roughly a million a year uh, on an annual basis. How many of those do you think are implemented by, by a percentage? How many do you think are implemented? Pardon? 10%. 10 percent. So it's, it's closer to 90, above 95 percent are implemented on an annual basis. These are small, I point out. These are small. In fact, they ask them, what's the smallest thing you could do, OK, to improve what you're doing? They have these posters up all over the place. Um, because of the fact, now what's interesting, the reason why that, that is also high is not only are people empowered to make a suggestion, um, but also they're empowered to imp make that improvement. They, they value doing over just thinking about doing. Uh, so if you, have, if you have an idea, you're working on your station, you think, you know what, it would be so much easier if that was a bit closer. So when I was reaching up, I wouldn't have to reach quite as far. And you make a little change to your station so you can just sort of reach like that. It's a tiny change, but that makes a difference. In fact, that comes under some of the ideas of lean wastes. If you've heard of lean and the, the waste, they were mudder, as they're called, um, that's, un, that's reducing unnecessary motion, as it would be called. And that, reduce, that obviously improves the efficiency of the stand and also your health if you're stretching. Um, now, if you did that, you're empowered to do that. In fact, what they would encourage you to do is make the improvement, do it, because it might only take a couple of minutes to improve that. And then, uh, and while you're doing that, you are empowered to stop the line so you can make those changes to make that improvement. Um, 
you then report it afterwards. So half, more than half of the improvements that they implement on an annual basis um, are actually already done by the time they're reported. They want people to report on them, but they're already actually implemented. It's, yeah, is it done already? Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> I had this idea and I implemented it. So, yeah, th there are a couple of nice things there. One of the things that I, I also, I, and the reason why I talk about uh, <laughs> the manufacturing industry, which is maybe a strange thing or something you wouldn't expect to be hearing in a talk on product ownership, is this problem I see, which is that we, we describe ourselves, so we work in the knowledge work industry. You know, we're a no we are knowledge workers, okay? That's quite a nice thing to be able to say. It feels quite good to say I work in the knowledge work industry. It's kind of like saying, look at the brain on this. <laughs> you know, there is lots of knowledge in here. That's kind of what I work in. I am the knowledge work, uh, as opposed to what? <laughs> as opposed to not being in the knowledge work industry, which is what the stupid industry or the not knowledge work or the industry that isn't learning or developing or improving. Um, I think that perhaps there's a bit of a, arrogant satisfaction uh, that we might gain from claiming this. And I think that we often, and I've seen this many times, um, we often use the manufacturing industry and it's sort of like everyone is in knowledge work except the people that are on the factory floor moving things through. And what's interesting about Toyota's culture is that it, that's completely the opposite for them, that they are not, they don't regard that. In fact, they see the people on the factory floor as the experts in what they are doing. That's why they have these approaches. That's why those people are empowered to stop the line, to make changes and to improve their situation because they are the experts of their station and what they do. Um, and I think that's an interesting, an interesting idea uh, that perhaps I think that, dis that separation between knowledge work and also that Taylorist idea of management owning strategy and owning direction and all of those things, and there being a separation between that and the workers, regardless of our presence in the knowledge work industry, I think that actually that, that idea absolutely filters quite strongly through into most organisations, despite them being in knowledge work. I think many organisations, things, in fact, that comment in the original definition on transparency um, is... Uh, is interesting because I've seen that before. In fact, someone said, oh, by ensuring transparency, one of the a, a PR in the room said, well, I, 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 don't normally, I don't normally share more than the next couple of weeks of work with my team. And I said, oh, okay, what, why is that? And he said, well, you know, I, I don't want them like working too far ahead. It would distract their minds, you know, as if, as if their minds would get too full. You know, they're, they're like children, you know. If we, if we showed them like a year ahead, they might start working on stuff that isn't going to be important yet. They could go crazy. They might get, you know, their, their little minds might get confused if they showed them the whole backlog, um, which maybe just keeping the backlog really small might solve that problem. But, the, uh, but it, yeah, so that, uh, there is this, I think, this idea of the management and leadership having the knowledge and the brains and the strategy as opposed to everyone else having it or everyone having it um, is a misnomer that has affected a lot of our thinking. So these are the two pillars. Uh, sorry, I clicked ahead too, too early. So the two pillars of the Toyota Way are continuous improvement and respect for people. Interestingly, continuous improvement is, is really what Taylor was trying to do. They wanted to bring this idea of continuous improvement there. Um, Respect for people, well, let's just say Taylor was missing that a little bit, uh, just a touch. So one of the, the, one of the principles under this is, is what they describe, becoming a learning organisation um, with Hansai, Reflection and Kaizen. Now I mentioned there might be some relationships to Agile here that we might notice. Uh, reflection, Hansai, what do we do that's involving Reflection? and looking back in Agile retrospectives. <coughs> yeah. um, and Kaizen means good change, small change, continuous change, variety of translations. Um, yeah, well, this basic idea, the foundation of Agile's ability to become a learning organization is this retrospective, is looking back to, to move forward. <coughs> so they do that a lot. And in learning organization, one of the important things is, is the stuff we mentioned before around the suggestion box and those, those ideas. A thing called nemawashi, which is building consensus. So we'll look at this uh, in a moment. But one of the things, how they, how they do this is if someone does pull the and on cord, they've said, oh, there's a problem here. Um, they then have a conversation. So conveniently, the line is stopped, which means everyone is immediately free. Okay? So 
generally, the manager is going to wander down, uh, the people in the nearby stations, and anyone else interested is going to wander over to wherever the you know the station is. So they have the an the Andon system will say, oh, you know, station one A is you know has a problem. That's where the, the Andon cord is pulled. So they all stand around this, and the guy's going to say, okay, well, there's an issue here with there's there's a chip on this door or something. I don't know what what's going on. Is this a one-off problem or is this a regular problem? I mean, they'll look at the the doors that are coming out. Oh, actually, look, the last three doors seem to have this chip in the same place. Okay, I wonder where that's coming from. Is it a problem with this station? Is it coming from further up? And they have this conversation. They're then going to have, um, they then use the fact that they have a nice group and everyone is free to consider a broad range of alternatives. So people will then make suggestions. Oh, well, you know, if we tweak this thing over here. And they tend to, they will then make a decision. Now, one of the ideas is, is that they, they take time to make the decision, but they implement that decision quickly. Okay? So they will discuss that and build consensus implement it, do an experiment, does this work? Okay, yeah, it works. So they decide on in some important things in this conversation. They'll decide on what we're gonna try and how will we know that it's worked. <laughs> it's kind of pretty core ideas when you're doing any kind of experimentation. Um, after that, they, they build, uh, after they've, they've kind of found something that works, they've solved this problem, that then gets built into a thing they call standardized work. Now this is, this is something that is really a, a Taylorist idea. You know, Taylor had this idea, which was new at the time, that it kind of makes sense that if all of the people who are doing the same job do it in roughly the same way, okay? Now, the key difference, and this is an interest, so this is the, the Toyota definition of standardized work. Standardized tasks and processes are the foundation for continuous improvement and <coughs> employee empowerment. This is really an interesting idea because, well, firstly, empowerment, I don't think, was a word that Taylor even knew. Um, but also, it, the idea that it's a foundation for that, and that's because the standardized work at Toyota is a record of what we are doing as opposed to of what we have been told to do. It's not a, this is what you should be doing, this is the way we do it here. This is, this is how we are working right now. It's a document that says, this is how we shovel pig iron in the Toyota factory. And as a team, if someone's pulled the thing and said, you know what guys, it might go a bit quicker if we change the size of our shovel. Shall we try that out? Okay, let's try that out. Pull the cord, change our shovels, let's get going again. How did that work? Did we have an improvement? Yeah, we had an improvement. Let's update the standardized work to say we're all gonna use the different shovels. Amazingly, gobsmackingly, that gets better buy-in from the team than Taylor was able to achieve. Um, slowly gonna have like, I've got collaboration on my foot. <laughs> um, so, one of the important things is, this, is that all employees are treated as experts in the work they do and encouraged continuously to present ideas for improvement, either that, either to their manager or just improve it directly or discussing with their team. Um, so here's a little example of keynote animation skills. Um, so here we have it, a factory line, and this guy's noticed, oh, he's noticed a problem. There's a problem here. So he's pulled the and-on cord. There isn't, I couldn't get him to raise his hand. That was pushing my skills too much. So he pulls his cord, he stopped the line, and his manager glides over. They were wheelies in this factory. Um, and he glides over and says, what's up? How's it going? Um, they then have a little chat, and he might say, OK, well, I think that there's a problem in the, uh, you know, maybe it's in the machining station here. And the manager might go, well, actually, you know what? I've only just been there. And I don't think it is a problem with that. Maybe it's, maybe it's where the door is being fixed. Shall we, shall we go and have a look? And he says, all right, maybe we'll go and have a look. So they then glide over and uh, they, uh, they go and talk to Jenny at, the, at this, this station where they're fixing doors to their boxes. Um, and, and they realize, okay, oh look, actually, yeah, so there's the chip there, it's not here. Okay, well maybe this is a problem with this station. Um, normally at this point, they'd actually have more people than this, uh, and you might have a, quite a number of people stood around the station having a conversation about what, what could be happening, what could be going wrong. They then decide on a way to solve it, and that then ends up going into their standardized work. What's interesting is that, is that they have this conversation and the management having a conversation with the worker, to some people could even seem I don't know, by perhaps Western standards, a little bit disrespectful because they will question them and they question them quite hard. So they will say, are you really sure that's where the problem might be? Because, you know, I've seen that. I think that was working okay. 
And some people sort of say, you know, really, is it the man? You know, the manager's kind of disrespecting them. They're saying they're kind of questioning this person. If they think they're the expert, then why are they questioning them in the first place? Um, so this guy called James Womack, he uh, he's kind of generally associated with bringing um, lean thinking. Um, he's, he founded the Lean Enterprise, and he's kind of known for popularizing lean manufacturing in the US um, from TPS, the total production system, those things. That's kind of what they called it when it, when it arrived in the States. Um, obviously, they needed to generalize it away from Toyota if any other car organization was going to pick it up. Um, so yeah, he, he talks about this idea of mutual respect. So from a management perspective, a manager is saying, to the, to the team members, I respect your close-up knowledge, ability, and dedication to solve the problem, that detail knowledge that the manager doesn't have. But the team member says, I respect your big picture perspective that allows you to ask me the tough questions that guide me to better solutions. And that's a really important relationship that both are seeing the benefits. The benefit that the manager has is that ability to see the big picture and to understand uh, what's going on. So let's bring, this, uh, let's bring this together. So you have to solve your problems together. That includes being, whether you're in a management position, a product owner, team member, you still have to work together on the problems. Has anyone thought of what the superpower is? It's such an easy question, really. It's kind of a giveaway. What do you think the superpower that we perhaps miss a little bit in the Agile community is? Begins with a C. Col co almost. Collaboration. That was very close. <laughs> so yes, collaboration. Uh, perhaps not the biggest surprise. Um, it is something that teams seem to forget all the time. Um, how do we bring collaboration into our product ownership? Um, it's meant to be a one-person show, isn't it? It's meant to be one, the one ringable neck. How do we do that? without diluting perhaps the perceived value in having one person. So let, let's tie this together. So what you could do as a product owner is you could start by bringing a hypothesis to your team. A, if we did this, then maybe this might happen. This is the value we might get. You then sit down with your team who will decide upon an experiment. And what, in fact, the question that should be asked here is, hey team, I've got this idea. What is the quickest, cheapest way that you could disprove my idea. Now, why do we say disprove? Why are we asking them to prove us wrong as POs? Well, um, in science and scientific theory, um, you will see that most scientists, uh, in fact, most scientists that have produced well-respected peer-reviewed studies, um, will produce a hypothesis, and they then spend, they structure all of their experimentation <coughs> for that research around disproving their own hypotheses. They want to prove themselves wrong. The reason why you do that is we have a subconscious, uh, an unconscious bias called the confirmation bias, which you may have heard of. Um, if you are trying to disprove yourself, and that's your focus, um, then you are far more likely to successfully do so than if you are looking for reasons why your hypothesis is a good idea. We have a bias that basically means we are quite literally blind to, um, blind to the evidence, and we will not even see the evidence um, of, uh, of things that contradict our, our, our made theory, our made, uh, made decision. Um, which can be quite destructive <laughs> at, at times. Um, so after that experiment, so we have, an ex we have a hypothesis, we do the team work on the experiment, they then get learning from that experiment. And again, they may well disprove the hypothesis. That's great. In fact, that's almost better than it being proved in some respects. When it's proved, I'm always really, really skeptical when I see things, especially when they come up the way that I thought they were going to the first time. I'm massively distrustful of my own ideas. Um, that learning feeds into further hypotheses. Now, what happens there is that gradually what happens as a team together, they formulate a shared understanding based on that experimental process. And in the, in the scientific community, that's regarded as consensus. So that's the consensus building. So actually, what you're doing is building product knowledge in your team via consensus as opposed to it being projected and injected into the team from a central point. Um, one of the other challenges I have with the idea of product ownership is that most people that work in, um, work in software teams have heard of the bus problem. 
with that phrase. So the bus problem is, uh, is the challenge of having a single engineer on your team that has all of the knowledge about uh, a particular subsystem or part of the system, okay? They cross over the road, a bus kills them, and then that knowledge is gone. But apparently, it's totally okay to have a single member of your team having all of the business and product knowledge um, and the bus problem. I don't know, the buses avoid them or something. They're better at jumping out the way. Um, but I, I somehow feel that that could be just as disruptive, if not more disruptive, um, to a team. Um, so. These are the five pillars. Let's go through them. So at number one, respect people. <laughs> you have to respect the people on your team. Um, and you can do that by not patronizing them, by bringing them all of the solutions, bring them problems to solve. That's what your engineers do. They solve, solve problems. They don't cut code. They spend a lot less time cutting code than they do solving problems. And you will empower your team and empower your project if you actually utilize everyone on the team to help solve the problems rather than trying to shoulder that burden yourself. Embrace uncertainty. <laughs> Nothing is more damaging to our, to our organizations than fake certainty. We love pretending that we know. We love pretending that this thing that we're building, this feature we're doing, is definitely going to solve these problems that we are trying to address. And we frequently make those decisions without having, you know, having not contacted our, our customers. In fact, there's an interesting point. Someone said UX. I said I would cycle back to it. I kind of cut out some of the UX content in this session because it, it kind of, uh, well, it could go off in a whole other direction, be twice as long as it already is. In, out of interest, if raise your hand if currently in your organization ux forms the central part of your kind of product strategy and direction as in when you're deciding what you do for your customers that you ask your customers doing some sort of user experience research unsurprisingly you <laughs> so I, I don't know how many people maybe what 40 people in the room perhaps something like that maybe 30 people one thirtieth of the room uh, i've given this talk a number of times now, and it's, it's never more than that really in the room. Um, so everything that we do, if we are not talking to our users about what they need, then we only have fake certainty if we are convinced that what we are going to ship is definitely going to improve the situation for them. Um, and interesting, if we're not talking to our customers, we have a wonderful uh, cycle of self-confirmation there um, as well. Um, Small experiments. So we overcome that uncertainty by doing experiments with our team, by experimenting and seeing what works before we decide on any particular direction. Accepting the fact that we just don't know, we don't know one of these five paths to take and saying, all right, well, let's do an experiment. Let's see, let's see that one and that one. Let's test these two paths. Do either of those work okay? Do they solve the problem? Oh, maybe they don't. All right, well, we'll chop those down and try the other path. Let's try option C now. Um, and be very open about the fact that there are lots of different options. Sometimes we get really frustrated and we almost feel paralyzed by the fact we have multiple options. Well, there's always multiple options. We're in the engineering space. There's always a thousand ways to solve the same problem. Allow the teams to explore and experiment with different options. And again, that shows them the respect to come up with ideas. Don't try to do cost benefit analysis and ROIs on different options. What's the quickest way you can prove definitively that one option works and one option doesn't? Sometimes what happens is, is it's safer. Sometimes you'll have big decisions early on in a project. Which framework should we use? What way should we do it? Which feel so heavy and so weighty and so critical. Well, in those situations, sometimes it's better to, to actually say, you know what, we'll just do both. Why don't we just do both? What can we do to make it easy once, the, once certainty is reduced and once we can see a bit more clearly, once the fog is cleared a little bit, what, how can we make it easy to, to delay this decision to the last responsible moment? How can we keep working maybe using both of these options until it's clear that one of the other is, is the best route? Um, and there are many ways to do that technically. Continuous learning. Every experiment comes learning, even if it invalidates what we, what we thought was the right way to do it. Um, learning is always going to move you towards your goal, even if sometimes it feels like you're stood still. If you're stood still in front of 10 options, okay, and each time all you're doing is saying, nope, we can't go that way, nope, we can't go that way, now you're not moving, but you are closer to your goal, okay? You have simplified your problem and decreased uncertainty. 
no complacency. Allow consensus to build naturally across the team, but ensure it's safe to question absolutely everything. Even those things that seem certain, especially the things. There's a great quote from Mark Twain. It says, it ain't the stuff you know, it ain't the stuff uh, you don't know that gets you in the end. It's the stuff you know for sure that just ain't so. And that is, is so true. Um, really realize that everything about the way you're working, about what you're doing, about what you assume your customers want, all of those things should be up in the air and allow for anyone to question them. Um, if something starts to feel like that sacred topic that no one is mentioning, the prickly thing that people aren't talking about, that is almost certainly okay. the thing you need to be talking about. When, you, when you, someone says something in a meeting and everyone goes, Oof, it's like that's the moment to jump in and say, hang on, wait a sec. <laughs> that's the thing we really need to be focusing on. So product owners can respect people on a team by collaborating with them on solving problems, embracing the uncertainty of reality. <laughs> Teams can overcome uncertainty by using small experiments to test their hypothesis, which leads to continuous learning uh, and builds consensus. I can't read it from all the way over here <laughs> on the validity and invalidity of a theory. But no team should be complacent with the present state of understanding, and it should always be safe to question anything, however certain it might seem. So could I ask the product owners to stand up again, please? So one of the wonderful things that happens when you begin to allow this role to become more collaborative and shared uh, is this. Um, could you just remove your labels? <laughs> Welcome to the team. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, so I do, uh, I do like talking to my customers um, and I have this is a magic QR code that someone told me I should start using which will take you to a little survey it's just to give me some feedback I have no idea I'm sure there is feedback within the conference but I found it fairly hit and miss at different conferences so I've just started doing it myself so if you do want to give me uh, a, a little a little feedback I would love it and highly appreciate it